All right, great. So I think I'm going to get started. Uh, I think the first thing I'd like to do is just to introduce myself. Uh, so my name's Mike McCost, for those who don't know me. Uh, I'm a professor here at the University of Washington. I've been here since uh, about 2004, and uh, we run a research group that focuses on proteomics. And of course, you know, a key component of that has been software development. Uh, you'll learn a lot more about tools that are developed in our lab, like Skyline and Panorama, et cetera. So we're, we're looking forward to kind of working with you, kind of seeing these different tools, and kind of learning a little bit about our, how we approach uh, quantitative proteomics. And uh, there, are, there are definitely a couple key things I'd like to kind of get across, so uh, the logistical aspects. So one is uh, the Wi-Fi password. Um, you're going to need to have access to the Internet at some point in time while you're here. Uh, the Wi-Fi is particularly good here. Um, uh, we'll see, though, with this many people in a room, you never know. It could end up being, um, <laughs> there's seats up in the front here if, um, uh, if you need them. Uh, there's definitely people want to avoid this front row for whatever <laughs> reason. Um, hopefully, uh, people will start to you know speak up and get to know each other a little bit better um, throughout the uh, the week. This is definitely going to be an action-packed uh, uh, five days or so. Uh, but this has uh, been a fantastic um, course. We've we've offered this now for a number of years, and every year it slightly gets refined. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the speakers quite yet, and the people involved in the course. Uh, we'll kind of introduce them as they come along. But you'll notice that, that uh, there'll be a number of people from our group that will be helping with giving uh, presentations, uh, helping with some of the tutorials, while at the same time also we have a number of people coming in and visiting uh, to help with the course. So I would kind of like to start off with a little bit of uh, expectation. So one thing is, is um, I think you should expect pretty great weather while you're here. Um, I know people always think of Seattle as being this rainy city, but uh, but the, definitely we've had fantastic luck during this course. There's definitely a seat seats up here in the front row if you'd like. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, so so this has been uh, uh, fantastic to to have great weather and and you get to come to Seattle. It's a great city and it's even better uh, in the summertime when the weather's uh, great and sunny. Okay. So uh, uh, so. Uh, so what else should you expect? Well, I think everyone here should expect somewhat to be challenged. There, there should be material here uh, that you know. Uh, if you've been doing proteomics or you've been involved in mass spectrometry at all, um, there should be material that you know and are familiar with. Uh, but, that, uh, but there should also be material that you don't know or that you feel like you could learn better. That's kind of the goal here of this course is to be able to stretch people's um, uh, um, uh, skill set and to teach people things that they didn't quite know that they that they didn't know. Uh, one of the things that we really want to get across uh, here is is a lot of the fundamentals of doing targeted proteomics. Uh, there's seats up here in the front, and uh, and we think of this as being. And I'll point out that this is often the way our lab approaches things, and some of our our closest colleagues. One key thing that I think our lab learned fairly early on, hopefully, um, is that quantitative proteomics is really not possible without extensive quality control and system suitability. So one of the first things that you need to know before you can start thinking about doing quantitative proteomics is knowing that everything's working correctly, uh, the sample prep worked correctly, the instrument's working, performing correctly, and we will teach you ways that have worked for us for doing quantitative proteomics. Um, uh, and doing system suitability. Uh, this, these are by no means the only way to do this, but, um, but it's always good to learn a way that's, that's useful. Uh, you should also learn a little bit about when a measurement is and is not quantitative. Uh, and I'll point out that not everybody presenting here, or definitely not everybody listening, will agree on this. Um, this is uh, fairly subjective, and I'll tell you one of the reasons why, how we think about a method being quantitative. Um, and I'll also point out that from my perspective, a lot of the methods out there that are called quantitative proteomics methods may not be quantitative. Uh, you'll hear this from a number of different people, and that perspective will all be slightly different. Um, and uh, I know that um, I, I will present a little bit on this. I know Lindsay uh, will present a little bit on this. I know Andy Hufnagel will also present a little bit on this. So one of the key things that I think a lot of people expect when they come to this course is they expect to become, 
either proficient or more proficient in the use of Skyline for performing quantitative proteomics. Uh, we've started to extend uh, Skyline's capabilities to handle um, small molecules or non-peptide-like molecules, and so some of that aspects will be presented as well. And uh, don't be surprised if you hear contradictory things uh, from different instructors. This, this is still a fairly new field. Um, we all, I think, correctly so, have slightly different opinions on things. Uh, and I think that's, uh, and you also might hear different instructors present the same things in different ways. So I think that's actually a strength of this course. Um, we, we all agree to sometimes disagree. Um, sometimes uh, we actually have truly different viewpoints on, on, on some of the topics. Uh, and I think we're definitely welcome to kind of communicate and discuss these things a little bit more with you. And so I think the final thing is that you should expect to have fun, right? So there's, there's a lot of material that's being presented here. Uh, this, is a, this is a broad topic. Uh, we're trying to cram a lot of things into a five-day period. But if it's not fun, you know, then, then we should, we're doing something wrong. So uh, we definitely expect you to have fun. Okay, so what is it that we expect um, from you? So uh, we definitely expect you to challenge us. Uh, we don't expect you to sit back and and to uh, not necessarily agree with this and to not tell us. Uh, you won't hurt our feelings. We have thick skin. We'd love to hear different perspectives and different opinions. We want feedback. We also want to hear that you want more or that uh, if you're struggling with trying to understand certain material. Uh, we've, we, we ask people to write up a little bit about themselves um, before they come to this course, and we, we definitely know and understand that course participants uh, come from very different backgrounds, and we think that's actually a strength of this course. Uh, we, we definitely like learning from you guys, uh, and uh, we expect to learn from you. Uh, we expect to learn the types of things that you're interested in working on, um, that you are working on, uh, the things that you're struggling with, the things that you found uh, great solutions to. So this, I think, goes without saying. The more you participate, the more uh, we will all get out of the course. Uh, if hopefully people, uh, there's plenty of seats up here in the front. <laughs> I think we're trying to save the back row if possible for, for people coming in and out. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, it, if you if don't ha hesitate to ask a question, if you have a question, it's almost certainly because somebody else has it too, uh, feel free to interrupt us. Uh, we, we actually want that interruption. We can sometimes cut back material if need be. We'll definitely try to make sure that we don't get off the, off the rails a little bit on a topic, but, we'll, um, but it's great to definitely uh, interrupt if you have a question. And we definitely expect you to sometimes hear things, not all the times, but sometimes you will hear things that contradict the literature. Uh, I hope that the person presenting that, those contradictory things, uh, will explain why they feel like this is, uh, that, that their, their opinion is, uh, uh, may, may contradict what's been published previously. But as I pointed out, this is kind of a relatively, uh, relatively new field. It's definitely been around for a while, but I think it's maturing. But that's uh, not saying that it's by far mature. Yeah, and you'll hear, uh, hear different opinions from different speakers during the course. Okay, so what I'd like to get started with is a little bit of, uh, to bring people up to a, a common level, um, give a little people uh, a slight introduction uh, to quantitative analysis of proteins. I think that you'll see that this may be slightly different than, than you've seen in, in other courses or maybe in your own uh, opinions. So one thing that I, I, that I think is important is why is it that we are interested in doing quantitative proteomics? Um, uh, I like this figure a lot. This was actually in a, in a, uh, in a paper from Michael Hengartner's lab um, at ETH. Um, I think this kind of uh, uh, presents all, you know, a, a major reason for why we should be doing proteomics. Even back in, in 2009, almost a decade ago, uh, when protein technologies were still kind of the protein quantitation technologies were still drastically improving. Um, this figure basically kind of, from my perspective, gave a lot of evidence for why we should be doing um, uh, proteomics on uh, uh, 
quantitative measurements on the uh, protein as opposed to on the transcript. We're in a department of genome sciences, and of course, in, in this department, uh, it's the, the viewpoint is often, well, why are we wasting our time, you know, trying to measure these complicated, hard to measure proteins, when, of course, you can do things like RNA-seq or, or microarrays. So I think, let me try to explain this figure a little bit. Um, it's a little bit washed out on the left side here. But their experiment was fairly simple. Um, they took C. elegans and they took flies. They took proteins from both of them. Uh, they, and they also took uh, mRNA uh, from both of them. They measured uh, the protein levels and they, between, um, uh, and they also measured the, um, the transcripts by two different techniques. This is before RNA-seq was out. So the two techniques that were out there were, were Afrometrics uh, microarrays and also serial analysis of gene expression. It's basically uh, a predecessor to things like RNA-seq, but using more capillary sequencing technologies. Uh, and and if they, they went and they looked for, there were about 8,000 clear one-to-one -one orthologs between worms and between flies. And when they took, looked at the correlation between the protein abundance, um, uh, there turned out to be a, a fairly poor correlation between the protein and the transcript, um, uh, regardless of the different method that was being used. Uh, there turned, it turned out to be fairly poor correlation between the transcript and the transcript between uh, the worms and the flies, uh, regardless of the different methods that was being used. Um, there was poor correlation between the different gene expression methods. So we always hear about how proteomics is irreproducible and things too, but these were two state-of-the-art gene expression methods at the time, um, and the correlation was particularly poor. Uh, but when you looked at the protein abundance between the different methods, it was actually really highly correlated between the two different uh, species. And one thing that I often like to, uh, to, to remind people and to remind myself and people in my lab, you know, there there's really is no selective pressure to keep a transcript at a given level other than trying to keep a protein at a given activity, right? So in general, the if the organism has tried to conserve a given protein sequence over a hundred million years of evolution between worms and flies, it probably is trying to keep that activity at a given level. Um, now, while we are not measuring activity directly, the measure of protein level is probably the closest proxy. So in this case, the protein correlation between uh, between worms and flies um, for these 8,000 clear one-to-one -one orthologs are extremely uh, well correlated. So again, this provides rationale, at least, for why we should be thinking towards measuring proteins. This is an old paper, and there are now many more, uh, more examples of this, of course, coming out um, uh, in, in the literature. So when, uh, when we first started doing a lot of targeted uh, proteomics in our lab, um, there were tons of reviews that kind of presented what they thought would be kind of the discovery proteomics to validation of those assays, and that they, they're often, almost all of these reviews kind of speculated that the end point of an assay would be some sort of a clinical amino assay that would be used to then uh, apply this measurement across many different samples. Um, they showed that, okay, this protein, you'd have some biomarker that was discovered by some new analytical technique. Um, and um, I'll point out that um, there are still lots of issues with clinical amino assays. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll get to see, I think specifically from hearing from Andy Hufnagel later in the week. And this paper is a fantastic um, review on this. This uh, paper in this Journal of Immunological Methods, which basically shows all the issues and problems with uh, amino assays. It's a fantastic paper. Uh, but some of the four major points that often get brought up, is one is that they're largely single plex. Now I understand there's things like Luminex and there's other ways of multiplexing them. Uh, in general, those tend to have certain challenges. We can talk about that if people are interested. There tends to be issues with poor standardization um, between different platforms for doing amino assays, different antibodies, etc. There's an aspect of uh, what's known as the hook effect, um, which, uh, which counterintuitively, the more intense the signal is, the more abundant the analyte is, Sometimes the less the signal you can get, you get. Um, uh, we don't quite, we don't have that sort of issues with with mass spectrometry. And also, one of the biggest issues that, that often get brought up, um, and the rationale for moving to mass spectrometry for doing targeted and quantitative um, mass spectrometry, is what people call uh, known as, known as is autoantibodies. And so, when people think about measuring biomarkers, people often think about wanting to use it for 
cancer biomarkers. And, uh, and one of the problems that people have is that these proteins are often coded in their own autoantigens. Oh, they're, they're, these, they're antigens that are coded in their own autoantibodies and therefore create false negatives in, in an amino acid. So I know I'm uh, preaching to the choir here to a group of people who are interested in learning more about doing quantitative proteomics, uh, but mass spectrometry obviously is a potential solution for this. Uh, there's, there's the direct detection of analytes by mass spectrometry. Uh, there's been great series of papers out there showing interlaboratory laboratory uh, calibration and, and um, uh, compatibility, improved specificity. Uh, people have been able to show because there's no sandwiches are formed, there's no, no hook effect. Um, there's no, there is saturation of the signal occasionally from mass spectrometry, but this still isn't anywhere near as bad as that of what's known as the hook effect. Um, we also get the digestion of all proteins, at least in a bottom-up proteomics aspect. Um, so that means you destroy the autoantibodies, so we don't have any effect from the autoantibodies. Okay, so here's a question for you. What does it mean to be quantitative? Anybody? Precise and accurate results. In what means? What do you mean by that? And 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 the so in the detection of something, or in the quantity of something. In both. both. Okay. Yeah. Is there, there was another point? I saw a hand back there. Yeah. Because the numeric results must be very Okay. Numeric results as opposed to ordinal results. Anybody else? So, so one of the things that we often discuss in our lab, that a quantitative measurement is, in the simplest case, is where the, the, the change in signal that's measured is reflective of the change in quantity. Now, you often want to put onto it figures of merit, like accuracy and precision on, onto those. But in general, more broadly thinking, it just means that the change in signal is reflective in the change in quantity. Now, that's not always the case, right? Um, so when you start to think about a calibration curve, and I'll point out that this, this holds true for all quantitative assays, whether or not you're doing a, um, a protein assay, a BCA assay, a Lowry assay, whether or not you're doing RNAC, uh, there's always some sort of S shape in this sort of curve. And there's a region here where, we, where this measurement becomes somewhat linear. And this is where we have this change in the quantity. Uh, the change in the area is reflective of the change in the quantity. Uh, there's, uh, we often look at two major figures of merit, and I, I won't go into too much detail on this. Uh, Lindsay will go into this in much bigger detail, but, uh, but we often think about these things as far as the lower limit of quantitation and the limit of detection. Uh, the limit of detection is the lowest point at which we can distinguish uh, the signal. Uh, from background, and the lower limit of quantitation is the lower point at which uh, that change in in, uh, in in signal is reflective of the change in quantity. There also tends to be this upper uh, limit of quantitation. In general, we tend to not think about this as much because most of our signals tend to be at the lower end. It's fairly easy to dilute signals, uh, uh, concentrated samples, um, and we tend to think much more uh, 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 stringently about this lower limit of quantitation than the upper limit of quantitation. I'll also point out with a lot of ion trapping mass spectrometers where there's automatic gain control, this is fairly rare to get a saturation of the detector too. So, so this is actually a pretty key component. This is a pretty key component of, of any sort of quantitative mass spectrometry. And whenever you start to think about measurements that are occurring from either a TMT assay, a, a SILAC experiment, Thanks to you really need to be thinking about where are we sitting on this curve. Right? That's kind of an important component. And, uh, and from my perspective, this is kind of a key component for making something quantitative, is whether or not you're actually getting a, a change in signal for the change in quantity. So often people talk about using internal standards. Um, in general, from my perspective, the internal standard is largely just an internal standard. It's meant to, to be a way of normalizing that signal. 
So in general, we think about it as being some sort of measured signal. Uh, but in the case of using an internal standard, we often think about it as being an area ratio. And, uh, and, and being this area ratio, uh, this ends up uh, improving things like the figures of merit, like the accuracy and precision in often cases. Uh, and uh, not always, but in general it does. And this is a, a key component, again, to trying to improve the, um, the quantitative aspects. We'll talk about some limitations about trying to do internal, using internal standards um, in quantitative programs. So what does signal calibration mean? So what do we often measure by mass spectrometry as far as a signal? <coughs> the relative response, yeah. So uh, um, some vendors try to um, calibrate their signal to counts, so ions per second, but that isn't that useful because we have no idea how many molecules give a certain number of ions. Um, so when we try to calibrate, when you calibrate your mass spectrometer, what are you doing? Even just the mass axis. If you're trying to calibrate the mass, the mass spectrometer, the mass. Yeah? You're trying to calibrate to some known resonance. Yeah, some known resonance. Right? For mass, this is fairly easy. You have some molecules with known molecular weight or known mass of charge, and you have something like a flight time or a frequency that gets measured, or and you're trying to calibrate that frequency or that flight time to uh, to those those known mass to charge. But signal intensity is a little harder, right? So how do we have something that's known, right? This is often a, a big challenge that we often run into in the field of doing and doing quantitative proteomics. And so we often make measurements. In fact, almost all measurements are relative measurements. It just depends on what those measurements are made relative to. Right? And in some cases, we have things that are known reference standards, like National Institute of Standards and Technology makes a reference standard for that individual sample. But in other cases, we don't. And so this is often a challenge that we often struggle with. But I'll point out that the purpose between calibration is not to put it on some sort of moles per something scale or to micrograms per milliliter. The goal is really to make it so that you can go between batches, between labs, between instruments, and to be able to compare that signal intensity. And I'll, I'll try to give you a couple examples of why I think this is kind of important. The purpose of signal calibration is largely just to place the signal that, that you're measuring on one day that somebody else may be measuring on their instrument on the same scale. Um, this scale is often completely arbitrary. And I'll give you just a few great examples, I think. So one is when you're weighing things and you're using a kilogram or a gram or uh, a milligram on your balance, right? These are all actually calibrated relative to the mass of a liter of water at freezing point. A kilogram doesn't mean anything other than it was a value that was given to the mass of a liter of water at freezing point. And it was, and it's, and it's as good of an arbitrary reference as anything, but it's a point that being said. So often people say, I want to be able to calibrate it and put it to micrograms per milliliter, but this is truly just an arbitrary value. Right? Um, I'll also point out, too, is that there is an actual kilogram. It sits in Paris. Um, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology have replicated it as best they can. Again, so all measurements are relative. You've got to make that measurement relative to that NIST kilogram reference, or that's measured relative to that Paris kilogram reference. But all measurements are relative. It just depends on what's being measured relative to. In kilograms or grams or weight, we tend to just have some fairly good references that we can measure these to. Meter is the same idea. Um, it's one ten millionth of distance between from the uh, the equator to the North Pole. Again, truly arbitrary standard. It's just a value in which everybody else can measure their things relative to as far as distance wise. And we can make, of course, actual meter sticks that are measured relative to some very precisely calculated meter reference uh, that people can use to make other measurements relative to. I came from an isotope ratio mass spectrometry background, and there we kind of make some fairly arbitrary references that we calibrate everything to. So if you're measuring 13C composition, 
almost every measurement is relative re relative to this uh, fossil called PD, uh, PD belamite. It's PD. Uh, it was a fossil found in the PD formation in South Carolina. Almost everybody in the world measure, makes their measure relative to uh, PD belamite. There is no more PD belamite. People can't find it anymore. So people have made references relative to the PDB, and then people have made references to the reference to the reference, right? And so it, I think you get what I'm going from, is all measurements are relative. It's just a matter of what you're making the measurement relative to. Standard mean ocean water, uh, there was a, uh, a guy named Harold Craig, who used to be at the Scripps Oceanographic Institute, and he literally went around the world and filled up a bucket with different amounts of ocean water. And any time somebody came up with 18O measurements, they measured it relative to the water that was in his bucket. And of course his bucket's now gone, but people have made references relative to his bucket, and so so on and so forth. I think this is a pretty critical thing, right? So I think we often think about, I'm going to buy some standard, I'm going to get amino acid analysis done on this to have an absolute quantity on, on this material. But my point is that all measurements are made relative to something, that amino acid analysis is made relative to some amino acid standards, that those amino acid standards are made relative to something else, and do you even know what the quality and the, the capabilities of the, the reproducibility of those reference standards or the ability of those reference standards to be with? In these cases, there actually are really great reference standards for them, but it's just an extra complexity. Okay. So the goal here, this is a figure that Lindsay um, has made. The goal here ultimately is to take a bunch of uncalibrated signals like in, from different instruments, different platforms, um, and, or between different labs, um, and, uh, and I think she'll give you some, some nice examples of this uh, and to be able to take this, this uh, a calibrated signal, put them all on the same scale so that we, what our measured signal is reflective of the over, overarching quantity. Okay, so when we think about this, we tend to think about things as a calibration curve. Um, we'll be showing lots of different examples of this, but it's good to kind of wrap your head around now. This is kind of a cartoon uh, illustrating this. But we measure mass to charge on one dimension of our measurements. We measure time in the other. And we have uh, a peptide or a molecule or an analyte will have some change in, in intensity over time. We then use this to calculate an, an extracted ion chromatogram for this individual mass. Uh, we use this to calculate a background subtracted area. And we then use this measured signal this area relative to things that are known amount in order to calibrate um, uh, this 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 uh, measured signal relative to some uh, known quantity or some reference. Uh, we of course can just you know extrapolate this into a simple a simple linear equation. And the overarching uh, question here is is that we believe um, the area is proportional to the moles or to the molecules or to the quantity of the material that's in there. I will also point out this this k is the slope of the of the standard curve, and this will be different between different instruments, different platforms, etc. Uh, and this area um, uh, of the blank should be, um, this AB should be, it should be approximately zero or very small. This is the area from, uh, that's measured often from just measuring uh, a blank signal. Uh, in practice, once you've validated that you have a linear response in a given range in which you're making your measurements, uh, you often then just have some working points in which you calibrate your signal to. And uh, Lindsay will even bring up a case where we often do these things with just single point calibrators. So whether you have an internal single point calibrator or an external single point calibrator, uh, we often just uh, will use a single point calibrator to, to define uh, the quantity. Um, nothing really changes when you use a stable isop labeled internal standard. The only thing that's changed is now we have a normalized uh, signal intensity. So we have this measured area ratio. So we have a a, uh, it's just a normalized signal as opposed to a, a raw signal intensity. Um, and this provides some sort of uh, improvement in precision and reproducibility and helps with peak picking and uh, it minimizes things like suppression. We can talk a lot about this throughout the week. Okay. So let's say you have two measurements, right? And you've only ever had those two measurements. Uh, a lot of people look at pairwise comparisons, condition A, condition B, healthy, disease, mutant, non-mutant, and you get two signal intensities that are measured. And if you've never validated your assay and demonstrated that you have a linear response, uh, what, would hap what would it mean if you have these two signal intensities?
That's, I know it's early on the first day. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's right. So, so in, yeah, I would agree, right? So I would say that the change in, in intensity, while there will be a difference in intensity between these two different cases, or it could be a difference in intensity, uh, they, that change in intensity may not be reflective of the quantity, right? So in, 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 the, in the simplest definition I had get, given, where the change in intensity should be reflective of the intensity, this may not be a quantitative measure, right? Now, is this common in bird humans? Yes, right? So a lot of our signals are often at the low end of the, of the level of intensity, right? So, there, so what I'm trying to point out is that there are lots of cases where the, where the quantity is a differential measurement, where you can truly say condition A is different from condition B, but I'm not sure that you can always say that the intensity between B and A is reflective of the quantity between B and A. And that's fine. That's definitely a, to- a legitimate measurement to make because all sometimes all you really want to know is what things are different between A and B, and you may want to prioritize those that have the biggest signal intensities. And sometimes people refer to these things as like signal suppression or ratio suppression. Um, and you get points where eventually, as you measure, make your measurements towards very low signal intensities, your ratios will almost always become closer and closer to one, despite the, the, the actual difference in the quantity being actually fairly quite high. Okay. So this is something that's kind of uh, an important aspect, and we'll talk a lot more about how our labs kind of use this and tries to approach trying to interpret this. Okay, so um, I want people to take just a couple minutes here and uh, and to think uh, think about these two uh, questions. Yeah, I think if though if you had enough variance, those would not be different, and you'd say there's no difference between the two signals. Well, if, if, you're, if you're lucky with your statistics, but that doesn't, you know, mm-hmm. the problem is that frequently we're doing statistics with very small numbers, and and and, those, and, we, and we're very prone to false discoveries uh, if we're if we're down in that level, level yeah. you know, below level of yeah. both, both of our measurements are there. I think. Yeah, if you, if you have large cohorts. The relative noise here is often very large, and and so uh, and so that it's really hard to actually see differences. It's, yeah, that's why often you need to find your one of your points often is fairly high up here, which is why the LO, LOQ often tends to be quite a bit higher than that the LOD because it's the earliest point for which you can distinguish it from your LOD. Um, so that, that's just, but that, you're right, there, that's not saying that's always the case and that would actually need to be assessed. Um, we, by definition, have kind of just assumed that this, this line, uh, so a lot of people have assumed that this is a horizontal line. This, um, that, but that's not saying that it always is. There could be a slight, slight or a lower slope in that measurement. But in general, uh, because of the variance and the issues associated with that challenges, what we do is we just simplify it and just assume it's a horizontal line. So, um, think about this in this case. So, you want to think about, um, and this is kind of a great kind of thought experiment. So, someone comes to you and says, look, I want you to measure uh, 50 peptides. Can you confirm that these 50 peptides have a linear response? Okay. Um, And that the measurement will have will be within above the lower limit of quantitation for those peptides in a complex matrix. And now assume another person comes to you and says, look, I want to measure these thousand peptides in a complex matrix, but I want to make sure that every single one of my measurements are within the linear range and are above the lower limit of quantitation. So just take a couple minutes, take a minute or so, think about this. 
came up, what would you do? And would there be anything that you would do differently for the first case scenario versus the second one? A, um, a whole cell life state, a tissue, plasma, CSF. Uh, something that's, uh, um, so we often get different responses just for peptides by themselves versus in something else. another way in which you can think about it if you, if you can't get synthetic peptides. So, I think what, what you're saying, so let me just try to restate it again, is that if you have a relatively finite set of peptides, like 50 or so, or you have really big budget, <laughs> you could potentially get 100 peptides that you can go order. Even at $40 a peptide, it's not insignificant, right? So this is this is a significant financial commitment at times. And so, at, so if you have 50 peptides, you think, okay, I, I can definitely think about going and ordering all these peptides, and I'm just going to go, and we're stable isolabeled ones, I'm going to take the stable isolabeled one, I'm going to make dilutions of it, and I'm going to assume that the stable isolabeled peptide is going to give a similar, same or similar response to the unlabeled, which is a big if, right, and then uh, and then I'm going to be able to use that to be able to define some of these figures of merit relative to it. But then there comes the point where it's, okay, even the labs with some of the biggest budgets can't just go out and order a thousand peptides willy nilly, right? Yes, you can have a defined project where you could order a thousand peptides, but this is something that's a significant investment, right? A really significant investment. And so, how would you validate and demonstrate which measurements are we going to eliminate? Yeah, yeah, so you could then take another sample, stabilize the label that sample, and, and make mixtures of that. So, what if it's Human pie. So this is an approach that our lab's taken, and I would say that um, so one is is taking 15 nanometer silic labeled cells. We call this uh, um, a match matrix or a dilutant matrix approach. You have some pooled reference, this calibrator, um, this reference material. And then you're making dilutions in it with something that will maintain the complexity of the mixture very similarly. Um, and this allows you to make sure to get this decrease in signal while, while, while matching the complexity of the mixture by adding something back in it that should be the same complexity. In a case of cell lines, you can do this in 15 n or silac label cells. In the case of uh, something like plasma, we actually kind of adopted an approach that's similar to what Andy Hoofnagel has often used um, uh, here in laboratory medicine. He takes human plasma and mixes it with chicken plasma. The sequences are diverged enough that you don't often get uh, uh, complexities associated with the different the same sequences, but uh, you still maintain a somewhat uh, similar complexity of a mixture. So this is uh, just to kind of show this kind of example. These are two figures that Lindsay in our lab has, has made. And so these were done in yeast. And so it's just the BY4741. And this is the uh, the reference strain that, that um, uh, Gamma Magami and O'Shea and Weissman's lab used to cap determine copies per cell or estimate copies per cell. And she diluted it in a in the um, uh, in the genome reference strain S2AC that was grown in 15 and yeast. She made dilutions. In this case, this protein, you'll notice that even at the maximum dilution, there was no decrease, there was no leveling out of that signal. Uh, there was no um, turning point uh, or inflection point in, that, in this curve. And then in the case of this protein, you can see that there was clearly a point where, where the, the change in the, when you dilute the signal, that the peak carry no longer started to go down. You often reach basically our, your limited detection, your limited quantitation. I'll, I'll leave it to Lindsay to present later how, how you, from data like this, you can just estimate your limited detection and the quantitation. Here's another strategy, right? So let's say um, you have uh, uh, patients with cardiovascular disease and patients that are healthy, 
and you have a specific protein that you're interested in measuring between those two groups, and you find the difference, but you're trying to now confirm whether or not that difference in intensity was within your linear range. So you take the samples with the two most extreme conditions, and you start to mix them at different ratios. And if there's a line that goes between the two of them, between all of them, so in this case there's five different samples, so there's 100% condition A, 80, 20, 50, 50, 20, 80, 100, then it then suggests that your measurement is in the linear range. Does that make sense? There's just no, these are the, the two ways that we've started to learn that if you have a large quantity of peptides or proteins that you want to be able to measure, and you want to be able to confirm that your measurement is quantitative between the different conditions, these are a good starting point. Okay. Another strategy that people often use is method of standard addition. Um, uh, this actually doesn't always work for very large numbers of samples, but again, you take a set of peptides and you spike it on top of the sample matrix and you confirm that you get an increase in the signal that's reflective of the quantity. Uh, this can't assess the limit of quantification. It can only assess whether the sample is above the limit of quantitation. What you see here is that this line then should go through the point before the spike. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So on the previous slide, so if you did that mixing, uh, mm -hmm. mixing experiment and it turned out that it wasn't the limit of your range, let's say you still wanted to make that quantitative measure, yeah. what are some ways you could go about uh, yeah, you need to somehow increase the sensitivity of your measurement. So somehow enriching the sample, um, depleting some of the more abundant components so you can inject more on column. That then tends to require some more assay validation or assay refinement. Yeah. If, if, if you would have a real nice calibration of why do you care? Like, could you then linearize your signal using this calibration based on the, on the response? Unless you're in the completely flat yeah, so that, that's the idea. Is that a lot of these cases, there tends to be, um, there's like this intersection of two curves, basically a, a horizontal one, that, or sometimes that one may be slightly going up. In fact, if it is slightly going up, then yes, you can gain some improvement by actually doing a curve fit to them. But in most cases, and you'll see, as I think we'll show you more, it tends to be almost a horizontal line. What happens is your signal, your, your background is what becomes the defining characteristic at that point. And so what often people will do is they'll, there's lots of, and I think this will come up about uh, when you start to look at, learn how Skyline does calibration, uh, there's lots of ways in which you can weight things that improve the, the distance of this linearity by, by weighting um, uh, your, your intensity curve differently, and there's different ways in which you can do weighting, and this extends this little linear range a little bit. Uh, yeah, so so what, what you'll often find um, uh, is that if you're, yeah, so it's really hard to make comparisons if the matrix complexity is very different. Um, so often uh, we get, there's a, this aspect of our measurements known as suppression, which depending on the other peptides that are coming out in the column at that point in time, it suppresses, it can, can suppress the signal. And so if you have the same peptide in a very simple matrix, you tend to see a greater intensity than if you see the same peptide and same quantity in a lower matrix. So this is an argument for why people often like using stabilized sublabeled internal standards because that essentially, that the stabilized sublabeled peptide becomes suppressed in the same level as the, as the endogenous peptide. Okay. So other things to consider, right? <laughs> So um, one of the things that we're almost always asked from the lab is we will, we will make a measurement of about 30,000 peptides or 40,000 peptides or so. And the first thing our collaborators will say is, I don't really care about the peptides. I want to know about the proteins. Um, so one thing to kind of consider is that we're not doing protein quantitation. We're doing peptide quantitation. And uh, we may have a gene that encodes a given protein sequence. Uh, but this protein may exist in many different proteoforms. Um, in fact, if anybody's here has done any 2D gels and done a 2D Western, um, they'll notice that there are often 
20, 30 spots for every single protein that you're interested in. Uh, if you go to cut out spots, it's not unusual to find five or 10 spots that all map back to the same gene. And this is definitely the case here, right? And so if we were, and if all of these different proteins exist at slightly different levels, and we're measuring a specific peptide that will then become the weighted average of those individual peptides um, uh, versus these peptides that span these other forms, either phosphorylation or different truncations on the proteins or different other PCMs, uh, the, the ratios or the values or the quantity that you're measuring will not necessarily be the same across all peptides. This is a very important thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, People will often come up with very elaborate ways to be able to combine peptides to give a protein quantity, but you have to kind of keep this in mind, right? Um, I'm not saying that that's not something that we do, either we do, we do combine peptides to give some sort of protein measurement, but we often know the fact that different peptides may be changing in different directions between the same sets of conditions. So you won't necessarily, you should not expect peptides mapping back to the same gene to be changing in the same direction or by the same magnitude. If they do, it's all great, <laughs> um, but it's often a case where they're not. And this, and there's lots of rational reasons to explain this. And every time we start to look deeply into our proteomics data, we often find lots of cases where peptides disagree with one another between different conditions. Another thing is that we sort of we have this ma massive challenge associated with with protein digestion. Um, this is a from a, uh, a figure from a slide from uh, from Andy Hoofnagel's lab in about uh, uh, 2010, and this is for a protein that's measured. Um, they measure these peptides across the digestion time, and you'll notice that some peptides uh, kind of keep coming up as the <laughs> digestion is occurring. Some kind of come up and start to go back down again. They're being degraded or being modified. Um, other ones kind of come up and they plateau, which is perfect, right? Because you assume that that signal isn't changing. Uh, one thing that's important to know if you really are that worried about your quantitation is you want to make sure that your peptides are behaving well during the digestion conditions that you're using. Now, in, in most cases of, of discovery proteomics, most people don't care about this. Um, uh, well, but however, of course, if you're measuring a peptide, um, let's say you have a five-hour digestion time course, and you're taking this peptide here, you could be seeing changes in different conditions because of slightly different digestion conditions. This is, again, affected greatly by things like nature, et cetera. Now, there are definitely groups that spend a lot of time thinking about their, whether or not they're getting peptides in, in a plateau region when they're, when during... Um, uh, during the, their digestion conditions. I just want to make a point that, 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 that this is something that is occurring in your sample. It is unlikely that all the peptides are digested, to com all the proteins are digested to completeness. Um, some peptides are going to plateau, some are still going to be released over time. So just because you get a large number of pro uh, peptide and protein IDs, uh, that actually could mean that you're in this more of these, uh, these changing regimes because the change in intensity is occurring over time and you, you somehow simplify your mixture a little bit or bias your mixture to those that were easy to digest versus those that were harder to digest proteins. Here's just another example here. Uh, we were able to measure it. In fact, uh, there's, there was a time, at least for some sample matrices in our lab, where we spent a lot of time doing this. So obviously there's some proteins that tend to flatten out um, fairly easy, even though the intensity may be a little lower. There's other ones that never seem to plateau out, you know, regardless of how long we tend to have the digestion go on for. Can, can I just ask yeah, you something? sure. Like, is, is it like this result of uh, how reproducible is this? Like, if you do it again, like this? Yeah, it's, fa it's fairly reproducible. Yeah, so, but it, but uh, these are things that are important things to consider, right? So sometimes, you know, heating blocks change or they, they shut off or they die in the middle of the night. You keep that those samples to go back and reprep them. Those are all important things to kind of consider. And, and if you don't even know about what the profile of peptides look like during the digestion conditions, it would be hard to make that call sometimes. So, and I'm, I'm not saying that our lab does this for every <coughs> experiment. We definitely don't. But if you go to a lab like, like the Hoofnagel lab that does this in a clinical environment, you could be assured that they spend a lot of time thinking about their digestion and the release of their peptides and, and any use of that for a, a clinical assay. So one, yeah, sure. Difficult question to answer, but so different peptides are digesting at different rates. Do you have any like uh, sense of what might be causing that for certain?
Yeah. 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 I guess. Um, so we can speculate a lot. <laughs> um, there, there's um, so a lot of it tends to be like AR, like re- thing. So often one of the sites gets cleaved really quickly, the other one doesn't. So that often is the case. You'll end up being this KK, KR type of things, and then you'll and we've gone back and actually tried to characterize it a lot. So often people try to avoid those potential ragged ends. If you will, we'll call them. Uh, the other one tends to be yeah. Um, presence of really acidic or negatively charged residues around the cleavage site. Uh, it's also, um, there's this, uh, uh, whether or not the, even though we try to denature the proteins, we're obviously using an enzyme to digest it, so we can't do too much denaturation because then we denature the chips itself. So yeah, so things that are towards the center of the structure of the protein tends to be slower. Some proteins are just really tightly folded. Um, and have a lot of structural constraints um, are really hard to digest. Ubiquitin is really hard to digest. It's one of those great examples. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think those are, you know, I, there's lots of cases. Uh, definitely you see things where some kind of come up and then they tend to go down again. Uh, those tend to be hydrophobic peptides. Those that tend to have uh, tryptophan actually more often than, than, than methionine. So oxidation of tryptophan tend to occur more frequently than, than methionine. Deamidation sometimes. So I don't have a good answer. There's just lots of so the best thing to do is just kind of assess it empirically if you can, if you need to, uh, and and see uh, whether or not those things are affecting or not. Yes. So fairly concluded though that uh, <coughs> over digestion will be helpful in this case. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so yes and no. Uh, so um, so so yeah. So sometimes people will will try to go out for a longer period of time to try to maximize this. What you'll start to see is that other peptides start to go down in that period of time. You start to see other artifacts. So it's this balance. I don't. There's. It's just hard. These are hard experiments, and and uh, and I'm not trying to play devil's advocate these things because obviously there's a lot of fantastic data that's happening, occurring. We get a lot of great results, uh, and and of course there's lots of these same sort of challenges and issues associated with the transcript level, uh, also in addition to the protein level. Okay, so the other thing is when we start, yes. Yeah. So the, so the key thing is is uh, what what I've seen people do, and this is uh, so, so let's say you have a ten hour digestion curve, and you really want to be able to measure ApoB, right? And so the key thing is, would you choose this peptide to use for ApoB just because it's more intense, or would you choose this one because when it comes up, it plateaus very stable? This, from my perspective, if this is within the linear range of your measurement, this may be a better peptide to measure than this one. Just, that's all I'm trying to make a point out of. And so the, the peptides with the greatest intensity may not necessarily provide you with the best precision in your measurement. Now, a lot of these things can be assessed just by looking at your within day and between day precision. And things that are changed, if you had a two hour digestion condition, obviously you'd think there may be greater variability between any one digestion and another because slight changes in the digestion will affect big changes in the intensity. So that's the kind of key thing to kind of keep in mind is to keep in line, uh, is do my digestion conditions meet the, the, the time course I have, meet the requirements for which the peptide? Are the peptides I'm using to quantify given analyze um, uh, compatible with the digestion condition of these? Okay. All right. These are good. Great to ask these questions. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so uh, one thing I also try to encourage whenever they use stabilized to label molecules, this is another thing to consider, is, uh, is do you know the enrichment of the standard? So, Obviously, you can look on the vial. Do you trust what Cambridge Extra Labs or ICE can put into onto that vial? Right, um, is one thing. And uh, and the other thing is is even if it was perfectly labeled, are you considering uh, its labeling correctly? So let's say you have this peptide here, this sequence here, and it's got 15 nitrogens. And let's say uh, you were able to have it perfectly labeled at 100 atom percent excess. So every single nitrogen, is, which is normally 14N, 
or mixture of 14 and 15 and a small amount of 15 and, right? Uh, and it's now completely 100% 15 and. And you were able to mix it perfectly in a one-to-one -one ratio. Some oracle was able to tell you that's mixed perfectly. You've got exactly the same number of molecules in it. And then you measured it in the mass spectrometer. Would you get a one-to-one -one signal? Yeah? Is it not necessarily? Yeah, I would say absolutely not. It would actually be off by just a little bit. Does anyone know why? Yeah, yeah. So what what he's saying here is that this one, this m plus one peak in this in this unlabeled peak, has some contribution of 0.3 percent of the endogenous 15n. That's this m plus one isotope peak. It's mostly 13c, and uh, this one, this one does not have an extra 15. This entirely 100 percent adding excess to the. So it's most of that extra contribution now is to the monoisotopic mass of the higher isotope number. And now if you go to like other labeling components, like 98%, you have a certain amount that's going to be 14 15Ns. And this is fairly characteristic of what you can purchase for 15N. And then we've done experiments even with lower ones. I'm not saying that this is a problem. I'm just saying that you need to be able to understand this and be able to correct for it. And if you treat this as an internal standard, there's actually no issues with it because you're actually your calibrants are occurring with your, with your unlabeled material. So people often say, well, you know, we, we do 13C labeling. This shouldn't affect us. Well, I'll point out this actually is a much bigger problem. And it's because 13C is 1.1% of, uh, of carbon. And so this is actually a much bigger issue. So, in fact, in this case where you have nine 13Cs, right, and that it was greater than 99.9 .9 atoms in excess, and you mixed them perfectly, you would actually have close to actually 10% difference in your metric two more testing. This is actually not insignificant, and it's something that I'm not saying is it, but it's most people think I mix them one to one. I should have a one to one signal, and I expect a one to one signal. And I'm just trying to point out is that these are things to, to consider. You don't expect to have a one to one signal. Okay, so I'll point out too that uh, this will get brought up a lot more during the course um, too. Is uh, and this is mostly just issues from my own uh, experience and being naive. Um, uh, and that is uh, a lot more thought should be put into doing the experiment design. So I think it's really important for labs uh, who are doing proteomics to uh, work closely with a group um, who, uh, who, uh, who has a strong statistics background. Uh, and the reason for this is, is because uh, uh, it takes time for someone with a statistics background to try to understand our data and to understand the complexities of our data. And uh, and that's often um, we make mistakes, and we don't often uh, realize that until after we've done the experiment. Um, and so one thing that's really kind of key to think about that we've kind of learned over the years is to think about how the experiment is being performed. Will it add unnecessary variance? Um, are you working through ways that eliminate and minimize systematic uh, effects? We have, I'll tell you one uh, uh, horror story, that is, uh, we had, um, I had a, a, a collaborator came in. She actually had human heart biopsies from living people. These are, these are incredibly rare, you know, you know, specimens. Did this enormous proteomics experiment. And I just did some very simple clustering, um, uh, 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 PCA analysis, and noticed that all the samples she labeled with, uh, with numbers versus those that were labeled with letters completely separated out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like perfect classification between the two groups. And I'm like, are those your difference between your heart failure and a healthy? And she said, no, those are the day I prepped my samples. So these are something that happens all the time, and you need to be thinking about how do you compare and correct for day-to-day -day -day um, uh, effects. Um, uh, are you minimizing these effects and working with a statistician beforehand, thinking about blocking, randomization, et cetera, is something that's really critical. Is your study powered correctly? But one thing that often you almost always need to do put into almost any grant application is justification for the numbers of animals, samples, etc. And those are kind of really critical in order to be able to do this. And that is largely based on some sort of measurement or previous measurement on your variance with those individual analytes. Uh, and that will tell and what you expect to be the, um, the fold change that you're expecting to get and whether or not you have enough animals or samples to be able to 
uh, overcome the the variance in your individual samples to be able to see the differences that you're expecting. So pooling or not pooling samples. Uh, so in, in case of uh, a lot of cases, you have uh, issues where um, where you can't make a certain number of measurements, so you start to pool them because you think, well, I need to be able to get through all of these, and I'm not be able to, I uh, won't be able to get them, uh, get through all of them. I don't have enough instrument time. I don't have enough money. Um, one thing to kind of uh, understand when you pool is, are your results what you think they are? This is kind of one of the justifications for like single cell transcriptomics or single cell proteomics, and that is you might see very different populations, but when you take all the cells combined, you see this weighted average of the entire community. It's the exact same thing with the pooling versus not pooling. If you've got a um, hundred samples and you're going to pool them in groups of ten, you may not see the actual differences that may reflect individual in individuals. Are you using the right statistical test? Are you correcting for multiple hypothesis testing? We've had lots of cases in our lab where people come back thinking they've seen lots of different changes and everything until they've corrected for their 10,000 or 20,000 peptide measurements that they're actually making. And then they realize that none of the changes that they thought were significant are actually really changing. So these are also something, the more things that you measure, the harder it is to find an individual thing to be significant. So people often say, I just want to measure more things. I just want to measure a bigger list of things. The problem is, is that the bigger that list, the more things you measure, the harder statistically it will be to find those changes. And the more replicates you're often going to need in order to be able to have that to be significant. Okay, so experimental variance is unavoidable. So what should you do? You assess for it, you count for it. And the one rule of thumb that I think we all live by, and that is always use more biological replicates. People often will come to us and say, you know, how many technical replicates should I measure? And I say zero, go back and get more biological samples. That's the main thing because the more, the, you're, in almost all cases, there's going to be much greater variance on the biological level than there is on the technical level. Always err on it. If you've got only instrument time to run 10 injections, make 10 biological replicates, right? 10 as opposed to making uh, three and three, you know, three biological replicates and three technical replicates. The technical replicates don't help that much. So here's a couple schemes that people have often used over the years. And I would say this upper left-hand corner is probably the most common one that people do. So this is a cases, uh, a control and treated and biological replicate one, biological replicate two, multiple technical replicates. And I think what I'm getting at is that that should never be a possibility in an experiment. You can't have one sample of a control and another one of a treated without knowing the variance between any between different biological samples on whether or not those be happening. You can gain your technical variance, but you have no idea if you take you know people who are vegetarians in this in this room versus those that that um, that eat meat. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of variance between just those with their vegetarians and those that who eat meat, right? And it's a different samples. Right, so um, a different minimal type of experiment is to have multiple different biological replicates, or even in that case, you can have multiple biological replicates with multiple technical replicates. This, you can see how this explodes the number of samples pretty quickly, which is why we all suggest just go back and get more biological replicates. Um, people do do these pooling schemes. You just need to be very careful with them. Um, I would definitely talk to a statistician before you consider uh, a workflow like that. Okay, so I do want to kind of get through a couple more things. Um, so one is, of course, we, we think about mo many cases of proteomics as shotgun proteomics, doing data-dependent acquisition. We collect a mat, uh, at each point, we have a separation across time. Uh, we, uh, we then, uh, at any one point in time, we, we collect a mass spectrum. We then collect, use that to collect data-dependent MSMS. The issues are, of course, these mixtures are extremely complicated. Um, and we can take a slice through the data like so where we plot an, a single unit resolution uh, um, uh, extracted ion chromatogram. They're basically one of the take home messages here. There are thousands of things that have the same uh, mass. And like we, likewise, there are probably hundreds if not thousands of things that come out at each point in time. Uh, this is a figure that uh, Han Yin Yang in our lab made a number of years ago, and the idea here was just to look at the number of features we find in the MS1 file at any one point in time. Uh, but one kind of key take-home messages were, this was in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but there was about 120 on average um, uh, molecular species that we could see in the MS1 space at any one point in time, and in some cases there were 250 um, 
that were there at any one point in time. So to, to be able to get every precursor using data dependent acquisition, we'd have to collect 121 MSMS spectra on average per chromatographic peak. And I will point out that some of the latest mass spectrometers can achieve this. But as you can imagine, these are just the signals that are observable in the MS1 space. As you start to get to lower and lower abundances, this is going to be even harder to find. So the way that data dependent acquisition often works is sort of like this conveyor belt um, uh, from uh, this I Love Lucy Lu Lu episode, and you're trying to kind of catch up with the individual peptides as they're looting off the chromatography column. And I'm not sure if people ever saw that episode, but it gets to the point where the conveyor belt starts going faster and faster and faster, and they can't keep up with wrapping the chocolates in this like tissue paper, and they eventually start to the point where they start to worry about whether or not they're going to be able to keep their jobs, and they're trying to, and uh, they start stuffing chocolates in their mouth and you know down their shirts and in their pockets because they were told not to let any of the chocolates go past on the conveyor belt. Well, that's basically the whole idea and challenge of, of data dependent acquisition, and it always basically misses. Uh, as least reproducible on the lowest abundant signals. Um, so this is an analogy I like to give, and so data-dependent acquisition is like going to visit a foreign city, but you're told you can only visit that foreign city by going to the tallest structures first. So this is a photograph um, uh, looking out of a hotel room uh, in Kyoto, uh, Japan. And I'm not sure if people have been to Kyoto, but it's a really remarkable city. Uh, but if you look outside the window, it doesn't look too remarkable. You know, you may look and notice, well, there's this high-speed maglev train. Uh, you may look that the hillside is surrounded by, you know, the town is surrounded a little bit by, by mountains. Uh, you'll notice, you know, it looks like any other kind of modern city in, you know, in, in either, you know, Western uh, uh, Europe or, or the United States. But if you actually went down to street level, you'd start to see some of the things that are pretty... Remarkable, you know, different temples and shrines, and you know the storefronts, and uh, and again more storefronts. You get to see people are dressing differently, and you get to see, of course, different types of food that people are eating. And so, one of the points I'm trying to make is that if you went to a foreign city and were visiting it by the tall structures first, you'd probably go into some sort of hotel building or some sort of office building. You may not be able to actually experience what the city's like at all if you're down on the floor level. So if you wouldn't learn much by about Kyoto by going to the tallest structures, why would we ever use this approach to study protein mixtures? And it's kind of like, um, uh, again, and I, you can imagine why somebody would want to go to a foreign city and visit the tall structures first. They're the things that are most popping out in your, in your field of view, just like the most abundant proteins often are when you're sampling them. So data-dependent acquisition, another challenge associated with it is that if you run the same sample multiple different times, you're not necessarily going to sample uh, the same things. Uh, and so what we often do is we build on people's knowledge, right? So we start doing things like a Google visit uh, search. We start to look for different things that you should go and try, what sort of foods you should eat. Um, and uh, and another uh, thing that we I came up with early on in our, in our lab was we started to look at C. elegans as a model for, for doing insulin signaling. And, and the earliest case is we wanted to study this, this individual pathway. We started to do discovery proteomics on it. We collected a lot of data in a lot of different conditions. But one of the problems was is that we identified zero proteins that were known to be involved in the insulin signaling pathway. So our first um, foray into targeted proteomics um, and target proteomics is basically just simply meaning where we've got a subset of the total mass range that we're measuring at an individual point in time. We tell the mass spectrometer to measure these things repeatedly as opposed to uh, randomly sampling uh, different, the things in the mass range as we see them coming off a column. The downside is, of course, we're measuring a subset of the total amount of signals that may be in the, in the individual data. But the key thing is that we get this completely complete data matrices. We're not worried about sampling between different samples. Lindsay will go into this a little bit more detail, but uh, but those two main sort of ways that people do it. One is with a triple quad, where you end up measuring a precursor c caused by collisions, and then you measure an individual product ions. And then in the second case, you then can switch to measuring other product ions to confirm the identity. You can also do this on quadruple or retrap mass spectrometers or quadruple time of flight mass spectrometers. But in this case, we're measuring the entire spectrum at all the time, and we extract the product ions from the individual data set. So a key thing to get used to looking at during this course is thinking about um, uh, looking at data as chromatograms. 
not as individual spectra. So if you have a target peptide like this individual peptide here, and these are the individual product ions, uh, these are now the chromatograms, that precursor product ion data. They represent often the same molecular species if they have the same precursor ion and they elute at the same point in time. Um, going back to that C. elegans example, you know, the proteins that pathway, the first experiment we ever did in our lab was actually reproducing that experiment using a selective reaction monitoring. Uh, DAF-16 is the 4 cat transcription factor, AKT1 is a serine threonine uh, kinase, and we can measure those individual peptides, we can confirm their identities with reference, reference standards, etc. And we get, of course, incredible quantitative and linear dynamic range. I just want to go forward a little bit further before running out of time. So the last little thing I want to cover in the next two to three minutes is should we be putting all this effort towards measuring reliable peptide peak areas? So almost the entire course throughout the next five days is going to be talking about and looking at extracting ion chromatograms, peak areas. And I just want to kind of get one kind of thing kind of started off with on should we be spending all this effort towards measuring peptide peak areas. A common way that people had done this in the past is they've actually used a type of measurement called spectrum counts, and they've made arguments that spectrum counts is, is analogous to doing RNA-seq, um, to finding, uh, to measuring reads counts. Um, uh, we don't quite believe that, and the dynamic range of, of the proteome is significantly greater than that of, of RNA-seq, so those sort of sampling experiments may not uh, uh, be applicable. Here's an early experiment that our lab did. Um, we took uh, human samples, so we took four micrograms um, in two, and in one uh, of the human samples, we spiked in 0.1 micrograms of E. coli. Into the second one, we spiked in 0.8 micrograms uh, of E. coli. We measured these each in four replicates, and what we expected to see is all of the human proteins uh, to be centered around zero uh, or one, one to one ratio. Uh, and all the E. coli ones would be uh, shifted by an 8 to 1 ratio, or uh, log 2, about 3. Uh, one thing that we noticed was the range over which we saw the signals. Um, when we measured the peptide peak areas, and we summed those peak areas towards a given protein, they spanned, and those protein signals spanned about 4 logs or 5 logs of signal intensity. And this was about a decade ago, so this is definitely older uh, characteristic instruments. Uh, and when we did spectrum counting, of course, we never really got signals that were much greater than about three logs or two and a half orders of magnitude. Uh, the biggest shocking thing was that the, the E. coli proteins were not necessarily centered around the expected ratio, but whenever we me uh, measured peak areas, which is this crowded algorithm, which is a peak integration algorithm that's still been carried forward into, into the Skyline tool, uh, this, uh, this shows that, that the distribution is one fairly sharp around the expected value and, the, uh, and uh, the, the, the accuracy around which the quantitation is being done is fairly narrow. All the spectrum counting values tend to be a fairly wider distribution and tend to be skewed towards a lower fold change. Um, and this is kind of just showing this a different way. This is the integrated peak area versus the spectrum counting ratios. And you'll notice that the coal-like proteins are centered fairly much on the 8x uh, change and the human samples are pretty much showing 1x change. But when you look at spectrum counting, because we tend to see things that tend to be just one spectrum counts, two spectrum counts, three spectrum counts, et cetera, and these tends to be you know, much larger signals, we tend to see this much more integer bin type uh, uh, signal that compared to the measuring integrated peak areas. People would often say, well, you need to look at greater numbers, you, know, you need to have MSM spectra, at least you know, 10 spectrum counts, and it doesn't really seem to make a difference. Um, uh, it tends to, you know, uh, with, just like we have with with peptide peak areas, bigger signals tend to give us better results too, and uh, and we still see this this large skew with the spectrum count data. Okay, so in summary, uh, I covered a lot. I think I kind of hit on a bunch of things that are going to be brought up and and reiterated uh, throughout this course. So uh, there'll be many more things, of course. Uh, the one is that amino assays are an imperfect solution to the protein quantitation problem. I think mass spectrometry has a lot of potential here. We haven't quite reached that yet, but we're getting closer. Uh, systematic errors do occur and need to be corrected, um, and this is often why we think about things like calibration and batch effects. And uh, 
High sequence coverage improves the comprehensive of shotgun proteomics data. So uh, we do have different proteoforms, and while we can't necessarily put Humpty Dumpty back together again from all the individual pieces, uh, we are at least able to make some sort of inferences if we see different peptides across the protein. Some of them are changing and some of them are not. Uh, we, it's good to know if you are using stable isotopes uh, to know the enrichment of the internal standard. Uh, this allows you to basically correct for some of the things like I pointed out, like 13C enrichment and also 15N enrichment. 13C labeled internal standards aren't perfect and require special considerations to get accurate isotopomer <coughs> ratios. Um, I think uh, it's important for people to think about how you're going to calculate the significance of an experiment before you go do the study. Do you have enough replicates? Do you have you done enough biological replicates or are you just doing technical replicates? Are you gonna be able to see the differences you're expecting to see given the variance that you have and the and the fold change you're expected to see? Is a sample size experiment a design going to answer your questions? And the key thing is is don't experiment uh, tolerate experiments with an N of one. You still see lots of quantitative experiments where they only have one condition, right? Where they have um, uh, or one, one replicate in each of the two experiments, uh, the two conditions. Uh, and in many cases, two conditions often isn't enough, right? Because you have two conditions, lots of things are going to go up and lots of things are going to go down. The key thing is, is whether or not those things are specific to your change or whether or not they're, they're just whenever someone gets sick or in major perturbations, for example. Often you need many different conditions in order to be able to make it specific. Okay, so I think that's what I had covered right now. Does anyone have any questions? By the way, it's great that people interrupted. We went a little bit over, but that's totally fine, and we're definitely excited uh, that people are asking questions. I hope this kind of keeps up.